Databricks created a great platform around its core product Apache Spark. But how are you going to use your DevOps toolset to automate this platform? In this little video series, I'd like to get to the bottom of this question. Hi, my name is Sasha. Welcome to my channel. If this is your first time here and you want to learn more about advanced analytics, machine learning and cloud computing, start now by subscribing and don't forget to click on the bell icon so you don't miss anything. In today's part, we are going to discover how to train and store our model in a service called MLflow with the help of our DevOps pipeline. So before I go into the training part with my DevOps pipeline and Azure Databricks, I want to do a quick recap what we did the last time. So I created an Azure Databricks workspace. The cluster have been automatically created with my DevOps pipeline. I also uploaded some notebooks for training, serving the model and doing the inference. That's what we are going to focus on today. This is currently in my user section and the pipeline also pushes that to a central space in a shared environment, so shared workspace and having them in there. I'm going to work only with the user specific ones and they will automatically push to a central space for running them. Looking at my Azure DevOps pipeline, I created a repo. I'm automatically syncing the notebooks from Azure Databricks to this notebooks folder. And I started already with my first pipeline, which of course has some variables like the Databricks workspace URL, my a variable behind the scenes, which contains my token to talk to Azure Databricks. Then of course, to which path should the notebooks be uploaded? So that's shared YouTube the name of my cluster and if the cluster doesn't exist, some further information on how to create a cluster, what type of cluster should be created. After that, the steps are running, first setting the Python version, installing my main tool called Azure Databricks CLI, then of course configure my workspace to connect that to the Azure Databricks environment, and last but not least, create a path if, the, if it doesn't exist, import the notebooks, create my cluster and start the cluster if it's not running yet. So the next thing I would like to do is really start training my model and populating all the relevant information to a service called MLflow, which is part of the Databricks environment. So let's directly go to my training script, which is doing all the things I need. So as you can see, I added two parameters in here. If you want to add them too, just uncomment this section and execute that. And yes, I want to use the ML cluster to run that. And this will automatically remove and re-add those two boxes. And after that, I don't need that anymore. For the training, I decided to use a publicly available test data set with wine quality information. So if you want to have more information about the data set, I added a link to this notebook. Then of course, I want to use some kind of framework to train my model. In my case, I decided to use scikit-learn. So I'm importing all the relevant things. And since I'm using a machine learning prepared Databricks image, scikit-learn, TensorFlow and other things are already installed. And I'm using also the MLflow SDK to communicate with the MLflow service. And the first thing I want to do is create an experiment or set that experiment. It will automatically create one if it doesn't exist yet. It says it doesn't exist, creating a new experiment. So if I run that again, that message should go away. And I've got an experiment in my shared workspace called wine quality. Then I'm just defining a helper method to do my evaluation metrics later on, like the RMSE, the mean square error, an R2 score. So those are the values I want to use. So let me create those. Then of course, I'm using those two boxes and populating two variables out of those. And last but not least, I'm downloading the data set, preparing the data set and just running my training itself. Since I want to record everything during the training, I now use the MLflow SDK again to start a new run, create an object for the model, 
training the model itself, doing some predictions based on the test data set and then use my function to get the quality metrics out of my newly created model. I'm also printing them to the screen and logging them to the MLflow service as well, itself, as well as, of course, last but not least, storing my model. There are specific functions to store models of popular frameworks like scikit-learn, like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on, to really directly store the model in a model directory. So let's execute that. So it trained my model, showed me the results of the evaluation, took around about five seconds. So let's go to my shared workspace again. And in here now, there's my MLflow experiment. Let's click on that as well. And as you can see, here is my run. Those are the two parameters. Here are the metrics. If I want to have that in a more tabular view, I can also tell it to create separate columns out of that to have a more precise overview in a, in a tabular way. So I've got all those values in here. I can go directly to the run, see all those metrics. If this would be more than one value, it could also draw a whole graph for that. There are no text in there, but I stored some artifacts, in this case, the model, which is my pickle file, as well as a conda file to create the conda environment and some metadata information about the ML model itself. So those are the three files which will be automatically stored in each of those runs. But that was completely a manual step. I also want to automatically execute this notebook with the help of my DevOps pipeline. So that's why I'm moving back to my DevOps pipeline, going to that pipeline, edit it, and add further parameters which I will need. Because I'm using the job functionality out of Databricks for training, I'm going to add two variables. The first one contains the name of the job, which I'm going to execute to find that later on in the system, as well as a blank variable to storing the ID throughout the two steps which I'm going to create. So once again, I'm going to the end of that, looking for a bash script again, using the inline version. And again, I'm using my Databricks CLI tool to execute the commands against the Databricks platform. So the first task I'm going to create is one which is creating kind of a background task, a so-called job in the Databricks environment. So let me add that, make it a little bit more nice looking. So I'm creating a training job. It's again an inline script. And like I did before with creating a cluster, I'm looking if the job is already existing. So I'm searching for the name which I specified in the parameter section. If that exists, I'm storing the job ID. If the job ID is still empty, I need to create a new job. Again, I'm using the JSON template, which I can get out of the documentation, or I'm again, I'm storing all those assets I'm creating throughout that series into GitHub so you can just download them. I'm specifying the notebook path. It's the train notebook. I'm giving it some base parameters. So I'm setting default values in here and I'm picking the cluster ID from the cluster I created in the previous step. Set the name to the name I specified in the variable section. Tell it that I allow only three concurrent runs to happen setting a timeout to make sure that this run doesn't run forever and the rest is pretty much empty. And then I'm telling Databricks to just create a new job, providing the JSON I just created. And from the return value, I just pick the job ID and store it in the job ID variable. And that environment variable will be pushed to the Azure DevOps pipeline again to set the global variable databricks.job.train.id and that's the first step to create the job. After I created the job, I want to run that and therefore I need a bash command again, which is the longest out of all those commands which I'm publishing in that video series because I'm of course using the command line tool to run that job now, give it a job ID, specifying the ID out of the variables which I created in the previous step and then set the notebook parameters. In this case, I'm set alpha to 0 0.5, the L1 ratio to 0 0.5 and want to have that run ID back and just showing that run ID. And again, I'm waiting until the run is 
completed, which means that I'm checking if it's either running or pending. And if it's running or pending, I'm going to wait for 30 seconds, check the state again, echo the, the current state to the standard out so I can see what's happening. And then I'm waiting again for 30 seconds, checking the states, pushing it over and over until it's either not running or not pending anymore. And if this is done, either failed or for example, succeeded, I'm getting the result state and the result message back again, echoing them to my standard out to see what's happening. And I'm doing the same thing this time in parallel for two other runs, one with a ratio and an alpha of 0 0.3 and one with, with 0 0.1. So I've got three different runs more or less at the same time. I'm waiting for both of these run to complete. And last but not least, I'm checking if all the three runs have been executed successfully. And if this is the case, I'm exiting that step with a zero, otherwise with a one that this step has failed. Let's save that and run the pipeline and have a look what's happening in here. Perfect. And the job completed successfully. So let's have a more detailed look at the run training st job step. So it executed the first time the job, it was pending and terminated. It showed the result that it completed with success and no messages, no error messages in there. It did that for the two parallel runs as well. Both were pending, succeeded. Perfect. So let's have a look in Databricks itself. Going back to my ML flow experiment. So all three experiments have been run. The values have been populated and just let's hook into one of them because the model has been created as well. And when I go to the job section, I should also see my job, which has been created in the background. It's using the training notebook. It's running on the ML cluster, which is currently running and it succeeded. So I can go to one of those jobs, see that this is the standard parameter set I created, no additional information and uh, my timeout, three concurrent runs. So everything set as desired. Those three runs happened already and I could go into one of those runs, for example, and see exactly what happened in the notebook. So there's a copy of that notebook with all the outputs of that notebook. So I can check everything in here uh, worked fine. And the next thing I would like to do is going back to my user space, wine quality and use the inference notebook to test my model. What I'm doing in here, I'm again using the ML flow SDK to access the experiment to get all the experiments with that specific name. I get all the IDs of the experiments back should only be one. I could also, for example, get all experiments and using that command to really get everything. So I'm showing the experiments ID. I'm only interested in those models where the RMSE is below 0 0.8. So I'm searching for the runs which meet this criteria. I want to otherwise view everything. And then I'm running through the list of returned runs and only pick the one with the lowest RM RMSE. So I'm showing that and want to have the ID of the model with the lowest value. So let's run that step. And it's giving me, first of all, only one experiment with that name. So that's what I expected. The one with the lowest RMSE and the run ID of that specific run. So after I've got my URL of the model, I can use the MLflow SDK again to load the model with a specific URI. And for example, show the values of that model, create a new data frame for testing purposes and using the model.predict to really predict that specific value. I can also use Spark functionalities to really create a data frame with more values and in the end create a user-defined function for PySpark with the model under the hood and just do a batch prediction based with the Spark functionality and the user-defined functions on the whole data set. 
In the next video, I'm going to show you different ways how we can use the model which we created today for inferencing. Are you interested in any specific topic which I haven't covered yet on my channel? If yes, please use the comment section below and let me know. And I'm looking forward to see you on the next video.